you just convert the PDF or whatever, and then yeah. Um, Okay, no, because Edson has got some interesting material that's uh, that unusual, so I thought uh, it's important to, to share that. Um, I've done some work in this area and I'm talking about um, how people respond. Um, so the the the, uh, the problem that I looked at was in Kashmir, uh, because I was there for a project looking at how uh, people respond when the internet is cut. Um, but in the course of doing that, I came across uh, this issue of, uh, of fake news. Uh, so what I'm going to give you some data and, uh, and uh, the, the idea is that to, to, to have some of the data and possibly try to use them in our context. So one of the things about Kashmir uh, is that it's, uh, it is a beautiful place. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it for tourism right now. Okay. Uh, uh, some bombs went off just near the airport, you know, uh, in very high security rate, so it's not the time. Um, but it's been this long history of conflict be between India and Pakistan. Okay, you, I think you, you, you all uh, know that because it's um, it's a Muslim dominant uh, state in a Hindu uh, a country, predominantly a, a Hindu country, and there's this tension um, mm. there. Uh, so what happened is that for a long time already there had been fake news. It's just that fake news is a form of radio. So the interesting thing is that. Um, when I ask these people, okay, so you have this fake news, the propaganda, how do you respond to that? And the young people almost unanimously say, we don't listen to the radio. Partly because it's, it's, it's not very different from what we have here. People don't listen to radio and TV and watch, uh, watch uh, TV and read newspapers. But over there, it's um, compounded by the fact that they don't trust the radio stations. Right? Both sides, they don't trust the Indians, they don't trust the Pakistani radio stations. So I ask them, who listens to it? It's all the folks. And I think one of the takeaways uh, uh, here is that if you ask around, okay, in a WhatsApp group, who sends out fake news? Okay, so far, anecdotally, and I ask the students, first I ask them, it's a sort of embarrassed silence, and somebody will say in a small voice, my parents. <laughs> <laughs> and I ask, I was talking to the body, my father sends the fake news in a WhatsApp group. So if you ask around, it is in fact the older folks, like me, okay, uh, who sends out the, the, the fake news. So you often hear, uh, uh, you know, news report that okay, with young people are not so discerning and all that. But actually, it's it's older folks, and somehow the younger folks seem to be more aware. I mean, you know, you know what it is, but they send out a lot less. Not that they none, but a lot less of this uh, big news. So I'm wondering whether it is, you know, looking at the, the Kashmir situation, whether because uh, the older folks trust the traditional media, sort of instinct to trust the uh, uh, traditional media. And there's some research showing that we have to trust printed news, meaning that the same information put in A4 and it's printed, they're treated differently. We treat the one that's printed as opposed to A4 paper you know, much more uh, uh, seriously. So I think that's one uh, kind of uh, interesting um, takeaway from uh, the, 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 the situation that I, that I uncovered. Um, I also have a question here about um, how, do, how do people respond when you have fake news, right? Um, and in the case of, of Kashmir, the tendency is just to, to block it. It is quite bad because they block it for as long as 60 days. All the research in this uh, area says that when you block off media, people get anxious. Uh, and in fact, there's sort of a rise, I was trying to determine, rise in visits to the psychiatrist, uh, visits to the psychologist, to get more medication, there seems to be some rise uh, there. Uh, I have a ballpark estimate, but don't quote about 20% seems, you know, increase in uh, anxiety uh, uh, levels. It's stress, in like, you know, medications, increase in medication. Um, so, so that is one uh, take. But the second thing that is much more serious is that there is no way to confirm or deny the, 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 the fake news, you know. So once you cut off, there is no way to, to confirm it. So people uh, in that situation, they are aware that hey, maybe, maybe this news is not, it's not real. Okay, and so they try to, to, to verify that. Uh, and when the news is cut, they cannot uh, verify that. Uh, and then it can be pretty bad because uh, what happened is that they've actually killed people. Uh, because like, okay, this, this uh, policeman uh, ran down um, uh, uh, a young boy, you know, in this village. And then the guy uh, is actually attacked. And then uh, in some cases, these people, you know, this, uh, uh, false news uh, acted upon and people are killed. So there's, there's, there's some imperative to getting the news right there. Okay. But even in that kind of situation, you can see that when people try, they cannot, they cannot confirm it, right? They will act upon it. So I know that we, we, we think that if people confirm it, you know, they're more careful, 
But the point is that in the kind of situation where um, there's some imperative to act, right? People people respond. My take on that is that the context is important. So if you look at all the things that we that you see, none of them really impact Singapore. Okay. I don't know whether you're going to turn because I got from you this data that the things in Singapore are two kinds of fake news. Crime about Malaysia, we know that crime is Malaysia, right? Okay. And um, fake news about businesses. Um, and that I attribute to the fact that, um, and I'll admit my own, my own bias, because I, I work with the Consumers Association, our laws are very strongly pro-business, which means that actually in both cases, the common factor is that there is an element of distrust. We distrust the Malaysian situation. I mean, many of us have heard horror stories about crime or, you know, uh, uh, police talking for no good reason, right? Okay. Um, and then, uh, and outside here, we, 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 we see our laws that being more pro-business than, than pro the consumer. Um, so on that basis, I would say that in the Singapore context, I don't see a serious, okay, I, I'm not going against the, the economic media, Ben talks about um, uh, you know, potential for Singapore, being strategic target and all that. I don't see it. There's no, maybe there is, but I don't see it. Okay, I don't see a, uh, anybody attacking us. I don't see the Russians attacking us. No, or, 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 I don't know, maybe Malaysians, I don't know, uh, because we attack them anyway for other stuff, but I, I don't see it. Um, my take on how do we uh, handle fake news, I think that, pardon me for stating the obvious, we have to handle it carefully, right? Um, because we know of some very serious downsides, uh, the classic one of course being the Spanish uh, Inquisition, where they were trying to get accurate information, right? Because it's a literally heaven or hell kind of information, right? Right information? Could have happened. Wrong information, hot place for aircon, forever. Right? So you gotta have it right, and you're doing it for your own good, right? Um, but you see the, uh, the, the horrors of, uh, of the Inquisition. Uh, so I think that's one uh, uh, kind of uh, yeah. So I think that the general uh, sense is that um, for our, our laws in this area, okay. Given what we see uh, in, in even in place like Kashmir with um, the news that is literally uh, life threatening, uh, the the kind of fake news res response has to be uh, has to be narrow, okay? um, meaning that um, as finely tailored. My own sense is that um, the harm that uh, Ben talked about okay, um, is is the kind of the, the political harm. If you talk about Singapore, right? What is the harm from knowing for having fake news about crime in Malaysia? You avoid Malaysia, right? What, I didn't harm. Okay, what is the harm of having a big tour that's plastic rice in in, in the supermarket? I, I, I don't think that's serious. Yeah, I mean, with all due respect to NTUC, I don't think that's serious. You start a lot of business, people come back to buy your rice anyway, right? So I don't think that's serious. Um, I think that's maybe serious. The, the serious part that we talked about uh, would be uh, the attack on the our electoral process. Which is, of course, I think we should uh, take note. Uh, but given that, then perhaps our law should be tailored so that I, I, I've written in op-ed only for the election period. Fake news, all eyes out, up, uh, out, antennas up for fake news during the election period, electioneering, and then and then that's it. After that, you know, uh, fake news for other matters. We handle it in our own traditional uh, laws. We have some mechanism to to uh, rebut rebut that. Okay. So let's look at two sentences. Part of that is already in place with respect to the speaker's point. But the speaker's point uh, rules get suspended for four weeks before the election. Six weeks before the election. Our election rules already, um, there is no there is no uh, 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 privilege on the election rules. Meaning that actually you would, you would have thought that for defamation you have uh, privilege, but in Singapore there is no privilege for, for election defamation. Yeah. Mm. Just the, yeah. Okay, I think we're ready for yeah, excellent. Excellent. Yep, so uh, take two. So, yeah, the, uh, I, I would uh, yeah, introduce my, my own research area. My main focus is journalism studies. I focus on both um, factors that affect um, uh, the news production side, but also I started looking at the news consumption side. Um, and part of news consumption now is the consumption of fake news. And while we have not had um, serious political uh, polit uh, fake news or political in nature in Singapore so far, um, I think the uh, concern 
um, about fake news is quite high in Singapore and rightfully so. So in, at NTU, we've done a series of experiments and surveys looking at uh, factors that uh, make people more vulnerable uh, to believing in fake news and spreading them. So um, the first slide would be, um, yeah, we tried looking at uh, the definition of fake news. So there are people now are saying you should no longer use the term fake news when you refer to this because um, different actors have different meanings associated with this term and you have um, some politicians using it to label anything that is against him to be fake news even if it's a legitimate news story. I and mean, if you talk to people, some people would consider um, opinion pieces that you read in the news as fake news just because it's not based on facts. Um, and if, if you look at studies that use the term fake news across the years, um, say from 2003 when it was first used in a scholarly article, um, fake news has been used to refer to different things, from political satire, you know, um, Daily Show by uh, Trevor Noah, um, also news parody like The Onion, people have described uh, The Onion as fake news, um, and then they look at advertising, and then the current definitions we have referred to manipulated photos or fabricated stories. Um, but if you look at these things, they vary in terms of their level of facticity and also the intention behind them. So the next slide would show, I think for me, uh, it's an ongoing um, uh, conceptual work um, that, that I'm working on, trying to really pin down um, what fake news is. So for me, um, if we look at, we can look at three things, um, the level of practicity, um, also the intention, the intention to deceive, and the format itself. So you can have um, something that doesn't look like news, so it's not in a news format, but it's still inaccurate, low in practicity, and also intended to deceive. Those would be what we call propaganda. They would come in the form of um, maybe uh, uh, things that try to mimic a government memo, for example, or um, letters um, that were just fabricated. Um, you can have something that looks like news that is based on erroneous facts, but they're not intended to deceive. It could be a journalist getting things wrong. So for me, fake news as a term has some utility, especially for the research that I do, because it refers to a very specific phenomenon. It is um, something that tries to mimic the look of news, but based on erroneous information in this intent to deceive either for ideological purposes or for financial purposes. And for me, that's particularly important. As someone who was a journalist before and now studying journalism, um, fake news in this context tries to um, mimic news so that it can also mimic or at least feed on the legitimacy and authority we associate with real news stories. So if something looks like and feels like news, it becomes a shortcut for us to believe this. If it's labeled as breaking news, then we start attending to this message just because we think we might think that it's legitimate breaking news story. So for me, that's particularly important. Again, um, that, that's based on the research area that I'm primarily involved in, which is journalism. So the next slide um, would be looking at um, uh, the, how concerned we are in Singapore. So I did a simple search on Google Trends. So those of you who use Google Trends, you can um, search for a particular search term and see the level of interest based on number of searches at a given time and also based on uh, different countries. So if you see, you see the, um, the upper most, uh, the top level photo, um, the search on the term fake news peaked around um, October, November 2016 uh, during the you know, uh, presidential elections in the United States. Before that, it was just all, it's almost flat. And then if you look at interest by region per country, um, Singapore ranks really high. We're third in terms of the frequency with which we search for this term. So I think it shows, and considering how small Singapore is and uh, compared with the first two countries, I'm from the Philippines, and the Philippines is about 100 million people, and the United States which is quite big. Um, I think the level of interest uh, we have on this term um, is um, quite striking, which means we have a high level of interest in this term. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, this is, a, again, a work in progress, and maybe later on maybe we can discuss. Um, we can, I can add more to this list, but basically I'm trying to map out my research agenda and on fake news by trying to identify potential variables that can account for why people would believe in fake news. So um, the SMCR model is a very traditional um, early 
communication model, which says, you know, when we think of communication, we think of the sender, the message, the channel, and then the receiver. So I think across all these um, different sections of a communication process, we can identify variables that can explain why people might believe in fake news. So first would be sender. Is it a credible uh, source or is it a familiar source? And now with social media, um, the sources we refer to might not be straight names anymore, but might be our friend, um, my mother, or my, my best friend, or someone I, I work with. Those become the, the, the sender for me. Um, and then others um, have looked at different shade between approximate and a distal source. So approximate source would be the source closer to you. Distal source would be further from you. So if I have, if my friend shares an article from Straits Times, I would perceive my friend as the proximal, proximate source, and Straits Times would be the distal source. Now these two different types of sources might have different levels of credibility for us users. So it could be that I don't trust Straits Times, I trust my friend very much. Or it could be a person I really dislike and I really don't trust, but he or she shared a Straits Times article, and I have a high regard for Straits Times. So how these um, layers of sources interact um, can also explain whether I believe in this information. So again, when we talk sources, we can't, we can no longer um, identify just one source. In social media, we look at layers and layers of sources and how we perceive um, these sources differently. The, the interaction between them can influence how we regard the message. And then we can also look at the message itself. So I've referred to um, the format. The, the, the closer it looks like and feels like news, the more likely that it can mislead people. Because we tend to associate uh, the news format. Um, you know, we already have established associations to what a news format is and, and, and that news is based on facts and whatnot. Um, also plausibility, the, the more plausible something is, the more we're likely to think it's true. So um, I guess you wouldn't believe that Hillary Clinton adopted a, a, a alien baby, but um, say the, the, uh, what's the pizza gate, um, it, when when a guy uh, tri uh, opened fire at the pizzeria, the story he believed a story that said um, Clinton ran an underground child sex ring um, in this pizzeria with her um, former um, campaign uh, chief. I think um, there might be some plausibility in there, right? Uh, it could be there. There might be a, a small chance that it might be real, and and that makes it more believable to some people already predisposed to believe in this. So we can also look at that at the channel. You know, is it a channel that you trust or you depend on? So now that we get our, our entertainment and our information from social media, we depend so much on these platforms. And somehow we might regard every piece of information we get from that um, channel um, with particular credibility just because we depend so much on it. Also, um, if it's closed or open, um, if it's something that's shared on Facebook, uh, posted on Facebook, some people might say, well, this is wrong, uh, uh, remove this. But if it's shared on closed apps, say WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger, that's more difficult to track. It's more difficult for us to detect that oh, something's already going on. Then usually these um, closed apps, um, the communication ex information exchange occurring in these involve people with some sort of relationship. Right, um, your friends or relatives, and so there's also trust involved in it. And then we can look at receivers, and, and this I would go um, into detail later. Um, there's what we call confirmation bias. We're predisposed to believe things that um, will confirm think what we already believe in. Um, an explanation for that is it reduces our cognitive capacity. We don't have to spend so much cognitive load in ascertaining whether it's real or not, um, so we just rely on, well, it confirms what I already know. It must be true. So a lot, many of the fake news that we see try to feed on, on confirmation bias. And also motivations. Um, why do we read news to begin with? Right? Some people attend to quote unquote news stories not for information but for entertainment. And the more entertaining it is, then the more useful it is for them. So entertainment might override the information value of the piece of information we see if we are <laughs> to begin with, motivated to process news for its entertainment value. So even if it's not true, but if it's entertaining, then you might share it. Um, and then 
Also, when we, in regards to feedback, and later on I will show that um, a reason why fake news um, spreads is that people were able to spot that these stories are fake, just ignore them. And, and so, the, so there's there's no mechanism to stop them from spreading. And also, pe- and people rarely correct others. And, and, and later on, I'll talk about what I think would be a stigma of correction in the context of social media. And finally, it's important to look at context. Uh, fake news thrives during periods of instability, when there's not a lot, not uh, enough supply of information. So, say, think of um, privacy's context. Right um, when communication lines are down, rumors will quickly spread. So when the demand for information is high, but the supply of information is low, that makes people vulnerable to believing in whatever information they receive. At the same time, when um, the supply information is high, which is you know, what we get from social media all the time, there's information overload, but the demand for particular information is low, meaning we're not really motivated to process then we might also believe in things we see just because we don't spend so much cognitive energy in verifying whether what we see is correct or real. We're just swamped with information, so we just don't even think. So I think those two extreme situations, um, at least in terms of context, can make people um, be vulnerable to fake news. So um, I think I'll start sharing um, um, some um, experiments and surveys we've done. Um, so this is one experiment I've, I've done with, with um, my student. We involved 189 students from NTU. What we were trying to do here is to compare the impact of proximate versus distal source. So we um, showed, we divided people into different conditions. So uh, one group saw um, a Facebook post shared by uh, Adrian Pango the photo versus um, other people saw uh, the name Adrian Tan, but with no photo. So we're tr- we were trying to manipulate um, the credibility of the proximate source. Um, and then we also tried to vary the um, distal source, so whether the news was reported by Straits Times or by Singapore Daily, which is a fictitious um, uh, entity. Um, and then we use real articles. So one of these articles is real, one is fake. Can you tell which one is real, which one is fake? So the New York story um, is fake. Um, it was uh, one of the most highly engaged um, stories from a fake news website. But the Bali story um, is actually real. So we had different combinations to see whether um, proximate source or distal source might interact in terms of how much people would think this story is fake or real. So if you go to the, the next slide, um, so you see here, um, in those who saw the fake story, 41.8% said they thought it was real. Hmm. So again, these are NT, there's our students for NTU. We teach them very well. These are communication students. And we give them good instruction. But even they you know, are, can be, let's say, they might not be 100% sure all the time that they get spot fake news. Um, when we showed them the real story, um, yeah, they were also weren't very good, although the, those who said it was real outnumbered those who thought it was fake. Um, so the next slide would look at, at the um, impact of these uh, different manipulations. So the, the what we're trying to predict here is how much they think um, that this story was fake, right? Um, so it didn't matter um, whether it's Adrian found with the face or uh, the, the uh, photo less profile. So the, in this context, the proximate source didn't matter, but the distal source mattered. So when it, when it was sh- the, the story was shared by Singapore Daily, um, people were more likely to identify the story as fake. But we also, but we, but, but we also saw that um, yeah, there were they, they couldn't tell which of the actual story were thing. But if it was shared by a fictitious site, then they were able to get the thing. Which means, I think for me, what we're seeing here is still the importance of um, traditional news organizations in Singapore. So we can say a lot about um, straight times and child news Asia and media form, but for Singaporeans. These are still um, authoritative sources. They are sources that they trust um, when it comes to news. So the next slide, um, 
I tried to do um, to measure the potential impact on journalism, just because that's my main, main interest. So the experiment, what we what we did was at the beginning, even before they saw all these things, um, we asked uh, our, our participants to rate how credible they thought um, the news media are in Singapore. So we asked them, give them a number of questions. Do you think the media is um, accurate, gives you complete information, or do you think they're biased? And we created a, a score um, based on that. And then we exposed them to the photos, the profiles, we asked them a number of questions. And then before the survey ended, we asked them the same question again. But then we just varied the order of the, the measures. So at least they don't remember exactly how they answered at the beginning. And then what we did here was we tried to do a before and after. So on one condition, in the fake condition, we told them um, what you saw was fake. And then we asked them, can you rate you know, how credible uh, the news media are in Singapore again? The other condition is when we told them what you saw was real. right? So if you see in the real um, condition, so before and after, there's just a difference of um, 0 0.05, and that's not statistically significant. So basically, when you when you tell people that they what they saw, the news story they saw was real, it didn't really affect how credible they thought the the news organ the news media are in Singapore. Mm -hmm. I guess because news media organizations are expected to report what's real, mm -hmm. but if you look at the fake condition, you see a significant dip in the score of media credibility. So we we didn't ask about ST or Singapore Daily, which is what they saw in the experiment. We asked them about news media in general. But we still saw a dip, and that is statistically significant. So for me, um, based on this, and this is a very simple question uh, uh, experiment, but for me, my concern is the more people see fake news, even if they correctly spot it as fake, or if they don't spot it as fake, that can have an, a negative impact on how we regard our institutions. In my case, I'm primarily interested in, in journalism in that the more, especially on social media, people try to, tend to disassociate the source from the message. And so if they see a lot of fake stories all the time, um, that might have a negative impact on journalism as an institution, in that there might be a uh, lowering of uh, trust levels in important institutions, not only in the media, but I would say even probably in the government and the other important institutions in societies, just because they feel like there's disinformation around them. Um, so the next slide would be, again, uh, this would be, this is from BuzzFeed, um, uh, 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 news and media entertainment site. Um, they looked at engagement. So for me, the earlier slide was in terms of uh, trust. This is in terms of just engagement. So if you see here, um, going to the election day uh, in the United States, fake engagement with fake news outnumbered engagement with mainstream news. So in terms of the number of shares, number of likes, number of comments, people were engaging more with fake news than real news. So it's not just trust, but even eyeballs, you know, and, and eyeballs are the, the basis for advertising revenues. So even the um, cash cow of, you know, journalism, I think fake news is also trying to eat at the pie of advertising. Okay, the next slide, um, so first that's the, the source. Now we also look at uh, the channel. So um, we've done surveys in Singapore where we we found that, um, say WhatsApp, YouTube, and Facebook are the most commonly um, used uh, social media uh, platforms. And then the next slide, we also asked um, just on Facebook, um, they can tell us how frequently they engage on like different types of uses. Like Facebook is used in a number of ways. You can play games, uh, chat with your friends. But if you look at, say, the top five um, uses, it's reading the news feed, reading news articles, watching videos, viewing someone's photo, reading someone's status update. We're seeing that Facebook is used mainly for consumption of different types of information. Information shared by your friends, but also news information. So Facebook, at least in Singapore, at least based on, on, the, on the survey, um, has become a very important source of news or source of information for people. So before we think, oh, Facebook is just about projecting yourself, sharing your pictures, but what we're seeing here, it's more about consuming information generated by others. So it has particular implications on 
what kinds of information are we seeing in Facebook and what's the quality of information that we're getting from Facebook. So, so in terms, again, of motivation, if we're motivated to consume information, then the more we're, we're at risk at believing in information, regardless of whether it's real or fake. Um, so the next slide, um, and also dependence. Um, again, uh, we've, I've run this uh, question multiple times um, since 2014, and in this survey, um, the, res the, the, the percentage of people um, who read news on Facebook has finally um, outstripped the percentage of those who read, uh, who get their news from local newspaper websites. Mm -hmm. So since 2014, the, I think this was in 2016, so Facebook is now the most frequently used news source. And again, that has implications on how vulnerable we become to misinformation on, on Facebook. Um, so yeah, so it's not just, again, the point is it's not just the source of um, news, but also the source of fake news now. And again, if we're on Facebook, we, I think it's also important to talk about the mood we're in, uh, the state we're in, we're on Facebook. So if I'm reading, if I go to, the, uh, to, to Stray Sam's website, at least it's clear to me that I'm in here for news. But if I'm scrolling on, on uh, scrolling my phone and I'm on Facebook, I might be in a more different, a different mindset. I might be in a more relaxed mindset. I'm trying to look at what my friends are doing, trying at photos my friends are sharing, and then, oh, I come across a new story. So you are in a different mood. So the way you regard inf news-worthy information you see might be different versus you're watching a newscast. Mm -hmm. At least within that whole hour, you're in a particular mindset that's just designed for watching news. But if you are, you know, seeing cute puppies and cat videos, and suddenly someone talk, I mean, you see, see a new story in Syria, or you see a story, uh, an outrage story, um, that will have implications in how you regard the information you see. So, yeah, here are just some of the, um, uh, what we would consider fake news um, stories that went viral in Singapore. You've probably seen, uh, heard of the uh, Rongo waterway terraces, the fake rice, the plastic jelly, and this um, Facebook post that went viral, which was an edited version of an actual story, an actual photo from Straits Times. So, next. So this is a, another experiment that we did where we were trying to predict um, the, um, how credible people thought um, uh, uh, messages were. Um, and here we were, we were also involving, uh, we were comparing whether you were seeing information from Straits Times, that the Facebook account of Straits Times, or if it's something shared by your friend. Um, we also manipulated the motivation. So we exposed people uh, to two, story, uh, two stories. Um, some of the stories were located in Singapore. So an example would be we created a st we created a fake news story saying that um, tuition uh, in there will be tuition increase in universities in Singapore. So that's one condition. So we're assuming that when when our students see this, there will be there's high motivation because it involves them. And then the other condition would be there's going to be tuition increase in universities in Canada. So it's the same story, but since it's in a different country, we were trying to, you know, we were guessing that people would be less involved with that story. So we tried to manipulate involvement. But, and then they saw the story either sh uh, as shared by Straits Times or as shared by their actual friend. So what we did in this uh, study was I had, um, I recruited six people who would then, who then recommended their friends for the experiment. <coughs> And then I used their actual Facebook profiles uh, for experiment to just simulate reading something that was shared by our friend. So what we see here is um, when people are in a high motivation condition, when the stories were about Singapore and will affect them, they rated the story as credible when it's shared by Straits Times, um, not when it's shared by their own friends. But when they're less motivated, if it's the stories about Canada or about Hong Kong and not about Singapore, you see that the difference between a Straits Times article versus a, an article shared by a narrows down. So I think what, what we're seeing here is when people are motivated to process information, they become more critical of what they read. So hopefully they become less vulnerable to fake news. But if they're less motivated to process things like um, radioactive sushi. Right? If you see radioactive sushi and you don't really like sushi, 
you're less motivated to process, perhaps your critical thinking isn't activated, you might share that to someone you who loves sushi, right? And that facilitates the spread of fake news. So again, um, not just the role of the source, but then the motivation of the person processing information. I still have time. Yes, you do. Yeah, okay. yeah. 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 All right. Um, so this is another um, another study is based on uh, survey, um, and here um, we did a survey uh, one year apart, first in December 2016 and second in December 2017. He, in this question, we asked them how often um, they came across false news on social media. So we see that there's really not much uh, difference from 2016 to 2017. Around uh, one out of five reported seeing false news on social media frequently to very frequently. For me, what's interesting is the next slide when then, um, okay, we can just skip that. Yeah, when we ask them, what do you do when you read false news on social media? So there are a bunch of different things we can do um, and, and that Facebook lets us do. You can um, comment on the wrong post, you can report the post until it gets removed, um, you can follow or, blo or block the person, but we see that at least in December 2016, 75% said they would just ignore the wrong post. Um, the number um, is slightly lower in December 2017, 68% said they would ignore the wrong post, but still the majority. So most people, if they see fake news, they would just ignore it. And so in the next slide, um, yeah, because of that, I've, I've done some um, uh, interviews with people um, basically trying to investigate why don't people correct others. You know, it should be easy, right? Um, um, uh, and again, in that earlier question, the question was what would you do if you see false news? Meaning, you're sure that this was fake, right? But still, a lot, most people um, ignored it. So for me, why would, not, why would people not correct others? And so I was thinking it could be that um, on social media, there is the rule that you know social media is for uh, maintaining friends or meeting new friends or uh, maintaining existing friendships. And it could be that people think correcting others might be against that culture. You know, if you, there might be some stigma in in telling people you're wrong or that what you shared was wrong. Um, at the interviews we've did, well, uh, we, we've done, um, some people said they are willing to correct others if it's a friend, like someone um, they went to NS with and share some wrong information about guns. Um, the guy said, you, I'll just flatly tell my, my friend that what he posted was wrong. But then um, when we, it comes to strong ties, it's, um, there was one respondent, she said, um, yeah, that her mother shared something that was fake, but, but she couldn't tell her mother that it was wrong. So she would just say, um, did you check what you post? Uh, are, you, are you sure it's correct? So she was very subtle. And I think part of that is, you know, she, was, she also didn't want to hurt the feelings of her mother. So I think if it's a strong tie, we tend to be more careful about you know, correcting others. And then a lot, many of our respondents said um, they wouldn't bother correcting if it's an anonymous person or someone they don't know or if they happen to see a long comment thread and these are just a bunch of people they don't have any relationships with. And the reason is they don't just they don't want to be involved in unnecessary arguments. So looks like at least on um, at least in the Singaporean context and based on the people we've interviewed, there might be some conflict avoidance on social media. But maybe social media is not just the the space for that. Um, for me, it's interesting because we also see in the U.S. and even in my home country, the Philippines, where all these we call them trolls, right, engaged in heated debates and exchanges. Um, so for me, I still need to, to um, think more about this. But at least based on our interviews, people try to avoid arguments, um, especially arguments with people who don't know. So it's also possible that, that they, they just don't care. Um, some of our respondents said, if it's major news or if it's news that's relevant to me, then maybe I'll correct um, fake news. But if it's just minor news, then I'll just you know, let people be. Someone said they won't, they just won't get in the way. And then there's also, I think, shame of being corrected. Right? Um, maybe we don't correct others because we also don't want others correcting us. Um, and we've asked our, our respondents how they feel um, if, if they've shared something that turned out to be fake. And a few of them um, experienced that. And how and we asked them how, how did that feel and what did they do after. So people reported being shame. Yeah, it was shameful. They felt stupid. Um, but for me, what was interesting was um, 
what they did after they were corrected by others. So someone said it was just quietly taken down. But there was one respondent who said, I will just share other things to cover that up. <laughs> so to drown the, the wrong post, you just share more. But that then makes that person even more uh, vulnerable to potentially spreading other falsehoods. Um, so I, th- I think it's, it's uh, quite interesting. Um, yeah, so I, I think I'll, I'll stop with that, so I think we have, we have some time to, uh, to discuss. But again, sorry, no solutions, but I think uh, in identifying um, these factors that can make people vulnerable to fake news, that you will be able to think of potential interventions. Mm. So if the source is the problem, or the motivation is the problem, or if it's the context that's at stake, um, I think we'll be able to devise particular um, um, uh, interventions. Thank you. Thank you.